Are you ready? All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the UPPD uh, Community Academy. So this is week five. Um, this is our final week. So I want to say thank you to all of you for uh, joining us on this new uh, virtual journey that we've done of this uh, Community Academy. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, each of the sessions and I'm, I'm sure you will again tonight uh, as we are meeting when talking with Dr. Thompson here to talk about some officer wellness and and resources that are out there for officers and some of the trauma and effects of, of the job that officers and their families have to to navigate. So um, just a couple of our usual reminders about um, using the chat function. If you have questions, um, don't hesitate to, to type some of those in. Uh, try and keep your cameras off uh, and you be muted so it doesn't provide any distractions for others. Um, but that's that's about it. I think we'll go ahead and, and jump right in and I'll turn this over to Dr. Thompson so she can get started. Unmute. Oh, here we go. Bam. Now you're good. <laughs> good evening. Everyone, I can't see you. Um, I'm Dr. Thompson, and tonight I'm going to present on officer wellness, uh, stress, trauma, PTSD, how to recognize some signs of that, where help can be uh, gotten for everybody. And if you have questions, I welcome them. I will um, leave you to chat with Ms. Hales, and when uh, she'll raise her hand when you have a question, I will answer it at the end of the slide so I don't get too distracted. And also, if some of you are watching the Packers game, could you send a score once in a while for me? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yes, go ahead. We are both listening. This is a hoquiam officer. I do a lot of training for departments, and the chief there gave me this picture of an officer dealing with some people in a car, and he had a little kitty in there, and then he rescued the kitty. So I thought this was an adorable picture, and he gave me permission to share it. This is the kind of side of officers you don't always see, and I like to remind people that there's a whole lot of things that officers do that have nothing to do with use of force. So I'm a licensed psychologist with the state of Washington. I'm also a member of the American Psych Association, and both of those require that I tell you that I'm not trying to sell anything, like a book or a new treatment method. I'm not soliciting clients, even though I treat the issues discussed, I'm not looking for new clients. I'm certainly overwhelmed. I don't turn cops away, but I'm not out seeking work. I'm not being paid to present. As I saw that uh, they sent out a little background, uh, just to kind of make that more personal, I was a Lacey police officer from 1981 to 2011. I started at age 22, back when women were not working in law enforcement very much, particularly in small towns. So I got hired by Lacey PD and was particularly welcome, but you know, I'm stubborn, so I managed to make it. So spent four years on the road in patrol, loved it, great job, really fun, worked night shifts so I could avoid, you know, the boring calls. And then I got uh, sent into detectives. I spent 11 years there and I became a specialist in sex crimes. I hadn't intended that, but I did. And unfortunately that uh, there weren't that many specialists back then. So I ended up getting loaned out to lots of departments around the state who needed uh, officers or elected officials investigated for sexual offenses and domestic violence. So that made me really popular. Mm -hmm. After that, I got promoted to uh, the road, back to the road as a patrol lieutenant, and we worked the road because it's a small department. And I spent almost 10 years on uh, Grave and Swing and enjoyed that again. I love patrol. It's uh, your own world. You're the boss, basically. You got to make decisions in the moment and you get to help a lot of people. It's a really great job. Then in 2005, they said, hey, why don't you go out and run the multi-agency drug unit? I don't know how I got picked, but what a great job. I got to wear civilian clothes. We got to go on big cases with uh, lots of drugs and guns and violence. And we rescued tons of kids, which was really my my field to begin with. So. It was a great uh, experience, and like I said, I retired in 2011. When I first got hired, I saw this whole core of officers that were older, way older. That, to me, they were older. I was 22, so they were in their 40s, and they were grumpy, 
and angry and multi-married, like divorced multiple times. Their kids weren't talking to them. They didn't like working. They avoided calls. They didn't like anything new. Most were alcoholics. So I said, I'm not going to be that person. That's what that job does to you. I'm going to leave at 30 years, which I did. But along the way, I uh, was studying to be a psychologist, and I realized what they had was PTSD. These were cops who had experienced the worst. They'd seen all sorts of terrible things. They'd obviously been hurt and injured, but there was no help. And in fact, I clearly remember being told once on patrol, I don't care what you see or what happens to you, you never cry and you never show emotion in front of the other guys. And there was no help for you. So what do you do? You got to do something to burn that off. So, you know, you can exercise. That works really well. But a lot of people choose to drink. And if you have severe PTSD, you can't sleep. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. If you can't sleep, you drink to go to sleep. So lots of folks develop really bad coping skills, and they still do. So I sort of made it a mission that when I got out, I would be part of a solution for that, where people could go and talk to somebody who knew about law enforcement and could get some help. Okay, so there's a dog and he's made a little mess there. Whole dang thing explodes. I'm just as surprised as you are. Whenever I lecture to police and fire, I always like to throw in a couple of humorous cartoons. They're kind of silly just because it's such an intense topic. And as I look around the room when I do these, these lectures, I do see officers with recognition in their face. Oh my God, that's me. Oh, I wish I get some help. I see heads go down, silence in the room. So I know that I'm reaching the crowd that needs to be reached. So we got to have a little humor in there. So I figured you should too. Okay, our topics are trauma and traumatic events, reactions to trauma, ways to manage distressing experience, PTSD itself. I like to say multiple times here, not all trauma you experience will be PTSD. And lots of people will have a PTSD related experience, but they will come out of it before it becomes full PTSD. So don't think because you're in a car accident, it's automatically gonna happen. And there's lots of things we can do in that first 30 days to keep it from happening. But we got to get there and help you. And so for those of you who are on cops, there's help out there. If you're in a bad car accident or any number of things, you can get help to make sure you don't get that. We'll do warning signs for mental health issues in law enforcement officers, which could be in regular folks too, but all there are some stuff that seems to be unique to first responders. We're going to talk about suicide. I've added that to my lectures in the last year or two because it is such a problem with retired officers although we are seeing it more with um, regular officers, and I've seen a ton of it with firefighters once I started treating them. And then resilience and prevention. Again, any questions, let me know. Okay, we got to define trauma. So being a member of the American Psych Association, I said, let's use theirs. Trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, sexual assault, or natural disaster. Immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. Longer-term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, and even physical symptoms like headaches and nausea. While these feelings are normal, some people have difficulty moving on with their lives. And then I summarize it as bad things happen, which cause emotional reactions. Some people recover, but sometimes. And that's what we're going to talk about is the sometimes. Okay. Him? No, he doesn't want a cookie. He says, I can have two. I love Labradors. I think they're amazing animals, but, you know, they're also uh, a little hyper and goofy. Okay. There are lots of traumatic events that we can experience in our life. Childhood, physical, and sexual abuse. And I did my internship at Maple Lane School for Boys, which was a prison for boys age 15 to 21 that no longer exists. But the two years I was there, I worked with kids who were really violent and had serious mental health issues. And when I read their files, almost overwhelmingly had been victims of horrific childhood abuse, sexual abuse, abandonment, multiple foster homes. And these kids didn't know how to behave and they didn't know how to act out when they were in pain except anger and rage. Well, that's where I really learned how to treat PTSD. They let me bring in uh, different kinds of treatment books and treatment techniques because they didn't know what to do with them. They were just giving them a certain kind of treatment. And I said, no, we got to fix this. These guys got to go back out and have lives and not reoffend. So I learned a lot about the disorder and brought that into my practice. Vehicle accidents, really serious ones, particularly with head injuries or where somebody dies, can certainly cause uh, be a traumatic stressor. Being a violent crime victim, that's like almost number one. 
natural disasters and fire. When we think about all those fires that we had this year, particularly down in California, people lost their homes, had to flee. Victims of war trauma, of course. Um, if you're present when a loved one is murdered, sudden unexpected death of a loved one. Now, this does not include where somebody's had cancer for a long time and they die a little sooner than you expected. That's kind of considered expected, not that you wouldn't grieve, not that you wouldn't be sad and depressed, but it wouldn't be sudden. Think of PTSD as a sudden kind of event. And then heart attacks. People don't know if you have a heart attack, you may get PTSD. It's a near-death experience. So again, not all traumatic experiences will result in symptoms of PTSD, but you want to make sure you take care of yourself so that it doesn't. Okay, um, you were sent a copy of this, and so um, it has a lot of things that happen to civilians, and the things I listed, they're on there. There's a few other things like being imprisoned, particularly when we know that imprisonment can result in some prisons in lots of physical assaults and sexual assaults. So, you know, right there, there's problems. Uh, torture is definitely going to be one. Life-threatening illnesses like the heart attack. All of those kinds of things can be trauma. Again, that doesn't mean you'll get PTSD, but if you get a couple of them, you're more likely to. If you get some of these and you don't get treatment, obviously that's going to be a problem. So you want to make sure that you get help when something bad happens to you as soon as you're able to do so. No questions about their trying. Did everybody fill that out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did we get some yeses there? Anybody have a comment about the, the sheet? Yes, yes. Anybody want to comment about the trauma sheet or they don't have to disclose anything, but. Uh, someone did say Packers end of first quarter is seven to three. All right. <laughs> <laughs> go Pack, go. <laughs> I'm a Seahawk fan, though. I got my Seahawk uh, neck thing here. Is that it? Comments. Okay. All righty. So let's look at the next one. And this is the one that we use for first responders. Oh. Um, feel fortunate how few of those traumas I've experienced. Oh, that's a great comment. Good. I'm glad. I like to see that. So the, the things that happen to first responders in both police and fire, we have to make sure we account for that. If I give them a regular trauma sheet, it's not going to work. So there are two officers who retired in California who have set up a trauma center that's a week long, and they wrote this wonderful trauma scale for us to use. So I stole it because they wanted me to. And these are some things, they have the, the natural things that we all have, but they have some different ones as well that are kind of something that first responders go to. Is there a question? Yes, she just a comment makes me think of ACEs that we look into for students. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. Right on track with that. Okay. So I've highlighted them, but I have witnessed, responded to or experienced a serious accident or injury. You're not a working cop or a working firefighter if you haven't been to lots of injury accidents. And I can remember some that were so bad where you're standing there trying to keep people alive, where it's pouring rain on you, or it's uh, 900 degrees and you're wearing a vest and you're trying, and all of the gasoline smell and the traffic rushing around you, you're wondering if you're going to get hit. It's a really traumatic experience in some of these. So we always look at that. Um, a lot of officers have held people's hands while they died at accidents or in some horrific uh, non-vehicle accidents as well. Have been involved in war or combat. Lots of our uh, officers have been veterans of war. When I started, they were Vietnam veterans. And as I was going along, they were Gulf War veterans. And then of course, the last uh, Middle East war. I have seen and handled dead bodies other than at a funeral. Um, yeah. That's something you do on patrol, lots of suicides. And the most common methods you see are shootings, which are graphic, and hangings, which are awful. And right now I'm already having some flashbacks of some I've been to. So this is just one of those things that comes with it. I've learned to manage those, but they're not pleasant. I have been responsible for the serious injury or death of another person. So sometimes an officer does have to shoot somebody. And that's not something the majority of officers want to do but sometimes it's necessary to save somebody's life, including their own. And you get a lot of distress over that because officers don't wanna take lives. 
And I treat a lot of officers for having to have, have pulled the trigger. And I've treated officers who had to do it a couple of times from larger cities where they work in really serious areas. So that's um, a really awful thing to have to do. I have witnessed been in an officer involved shooting or been attacked with a weapon other than military combat in which I thought I would be seriously hurt or killed. Again, working cops, that's something that happens a lot. Um, there's People forget about the knives and the broken whiskey bottles and the clubs and the axes. And I had a friend who was uh, attacked by a logger with a chainsaw. So there are lots of bad things that happen and lots of things that can be used as weapons. And in every house, you know there are knives and you don't know the house, but they do. You don't know if they have a shotgun around the corner. There's just so many weapons available to people. So as we scale down to the yellow again, I've witnessed or experienced an mm -hmm. event that caused me to be seriously hurt or feared I might've been hurt or killed. So officers are in car accidents too. Uh, they chase people in wrestling matches and get hurt. Uh, all sorts of things happen. Um, most officers have some minor injuries at some point. It's just the way it is. You're gonna fall into something, get hit by something. <clears throat> I had to take someone's life. Not every shooting ends in somebody dying, but yes, that happens. And I've also treated officers who had to fight for their lives and they had to use a neck restraint to get knock the person out and they died because they um, had other things going on. But you know, it's him or the officer. I've experienced the suicide of a coworker. They put that one in because cops lose a lot of friends to suicide. Um, I know one of our officers killed themselves. I have worked with lots of officers whose friends have killed themselves. I worked with an officer whose friend killed himself in the next room. Uh, it's it's uh, horrific what's going on right now with officer suicide. I have handled an incident involving the death or serious injury of a child. That was 11 years of my life working uh, in, with sex crimes and child abuse. I went to several child autopsies. I saw um, children who were grossly injured to the point of brain damage and near death. So really horrific stuff. And, and that's hard, particularly if the officer has children because they you know, naturally relate to that. <clears throat> I've been involved in or witnessed an incident of mass, ca mass casualty. You only have to look at the news to see officers are responding to shootings everywhere, schools, um, diff different places where um, People gather. There was one the other night somewhere where people were at a, I was up here, wasn't it? Somewhere around here where there was a shooting where people were gathered at some sort of party and they shot at each other. This is much more common than it used to be when I um, was working. I've been involved in an incident that was publicized with ne uh, negative media influence. I've had several officers come in with that. And nowadays, of course, every incident that officers do is on Facebook and it's in the media and people comment and people don't always know the details and give their opinions and how it should have been handled. That's hard for officers because they can't defend themselves. And most of the time, these are things that have happened because that was how you, you know, the person asked for that by the way they behaved. So, you know, it's hard for the officer that just adds more negative stuff to the things they're already dealing with. And I've experienced an on-duty incident in which I believe my safety was in peril uh, kind of almost daily in some jurisdictions. I work with a lot of officers from big departments and, you know, they're, if they work in really bad districts, they're in danger all the time. So that you can see, these are things that the average person doesn't really deal with as much as we do. Okay. So, oh, question? Yes. Good, I can have a drink of Diet Coke. You bet. Let's take a break. Uh, a good chunk of the list applies directly to soldiers and combatants. Everything from suicide of, of fiends, hostile situation, to negative media. Absolutely. <clears throat> That's a comment. Um, question. Do you have them answer anything that might relate to childhood trauma? Childhood trauma can affect how, as a, an adult, they might deal with similar traumatic experiences. Yes, we do history on everybody that comes in. That's just part of being a therapist for any kind of disorder. And yes, um, that was designed to use for both combat and police because they're very similar. So yeah, you have a good observation. Okay, uh, and by, yeah, I have to also treated veterans. So uh, law enforcement fight for life. These are the types of things that we see for law enforcement, we have a fight for life. And this is underappreciated by everybody in uh, law enforcement until it happens to them. And 
I don't always think that sometimes the admins pay attention to this one. Fight for life is where the officers usually by themselves, maybe there's two, and the individual is usually completely out of their sanity. So they're usually high on drugs. Oftentimes they don't feel pain and the officer is fighting the individual and they're trying to get their gun or hurt them with some object. The rule is most of the time when you fight men, they're trying to get away. They're not interested in really hurting you. They want to get away. If the person's staying and fighting you, they're likely wanting to hurt you. So that's kind of a gauge for that sort of thing because people who want to get away, they just want to do enough to flee. Well, the fight for life, the officers often nearly kill. They're maybe bashed in the head. The person's trying to grab their gun. They can't, any hold they use doesn't work. I went to one where we tased the guy three times. He was huge. He was angry. He was high on something and he got tased three times. We used up our tasers, didn't work. Um, went to uh, another one where we fought the guy and fought the guy and he wouldn't go down and he was high on PCP. He was a bodybuilder on steroids, all of those things. What do you do? And we were fortunate we were able to find a way, but in some cases there isn't. So those are really difficult situations and they, I always feel like they should be sent, the officers in those situations should be sent in for a debrief because they've had to fight for their life. Shootings, of course, most departments do some sort of debrief for that because that's a major event. Witnessing horrific death or dealing with deaths outside the ordinary, just talked about that. We do see death on a regular basis, injury to their fellow officers, death to their fellow officers, because sometimes you feel like that's really who understands your job and who you can depend on. So that's a big deal for us, much like a family member. Firefighters um, take it real personally when they go to a medical call and they can't stabilize the person. Is that a question? Is that not standard practice to debrief after that type of incident? Only shootings. Now, some departments, if they think it's serious enough, will send them in. But I've been quietly trying to change their mind about the fight for life. I just think that that's sometimes where I point to the person going downhill rapidly into other problems because of what happened there. So great question, but not seeing it across the board yet. Unable to stabilize a patient in the field for firefighters, they're uh, medical trained, most of them, and they have medics and um, aid people, and they take it real personal when somebody, they can't keep them alive enough to get them to the hospital. Another question? Just a statement based on your answer. That is unacceptable. Even in the classroom, we debrief after an incident. Awesome, I like it. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so, so I've treated a number of medics who were so burned out from people dying in their care who they couldn't have saved. They couldn't possibly have saved, but they feel really personal because that's their job. And I think I've seen some of the worst PTSD in uh, medics. <clears throat> and, and I treated some combat medics as well who also saw horrific things in combat also the same way. They couldn't save you know, soldiers who were wounded and lost limbs, that sort of thing. Death of occupants in fire, firefighters feel they go to a fire, they should be able to rescue everybody. If it's a fully involved fire and it's falling down all over, you're not gonna rescue people, but they carry that guilt. Injury or death of a fellow firefighter at a scene, that's of course bothersome, bothersome to them because just like for police, I've had a number of them who were trapped in fires where walls were falling in on them. I visualize that, it never happened to me obviously, but I visualize that and go, that must be just incredibly horrific and scary and I'm gonna die and you know, and it's hot and you're in those suits. So if you think about that, that would be a terrible thing to experience. And a number of them have fallen through roofs that were burning. So, you know, sometimes we think firefighters have it easy, but that's not true. Of course, natural disasters, we respond, first responders respond to that. And um, a lot of times people are trapped and so um, I've treated people who actually were at 9-11, and I've treated people who were at Oso, the mudslide, and had to dig out dead bodies. Serious physical assaults to themselves are pretty common, and uh, you always hope you have a partner there. It's a lot easier. Uh, motor vehicle accidents, of course, and heart attacks to them. Police are pretty high on having heart attacks as they get older. So what we see all the time, mayhem and death for first responders, bodies in various states of decomposition. Composition. I always put odor because a body that's been dead a while from suicide in the heat, 
there is nothing worse to smell. And that's something that is, you know, makes you nauseous. And you remember that. Burning or buried bodies. I, I've went to a number of house fires where people were burned up in those. And, and detectives used to have to go to those. That's pretty horrific. And, of course, abused and battered children, helpless, elderly Children who are citizens who make poor decisions that lead to harm. Uh, I'll just say 4th of July and people with fireworks. That's pretty common for every law enforcement agency. Filth, disease, and biohazards, because we have to worry about catching that stuff when we're out there. Chemical threats, overturned trucks, train accidents. We used to have a train in Lacey in case we had an accident. And threats to our own safety, of course, which I went over for all of those. So, let's see, I can't hardly see. First responders see things on a regular basis that no one should ever see. And I think if we remember that, you may see something bad, but unless you're in combat or a first responder of some sort or emergency people who work in emergency rooms, you don't see it all the time and on a regular basis. So, you have time to recover. And a lot of times you don't have time to recover when you're first responding. <clears throat> So after all of that, we need to see a panda rolling uh, a big snowball. <laughs> okay, so this impacts the body. It isn't just that you saw it. There's a lot of stuff that happens when you meet, rise up to meet a critical incident, whether you're facing a shooting or you're responding to a major car accident or fighting a fire. You're going to hyperarousal. You might have known that when you go for sports, or but it's not a threat to you. It's just really important to you. So your adrenaline pumps and cortisol's dumped into the body to prepare you to meet whatever you're going to do. Now, with the case of first responders, it's a threat to their person or others. So their heightened alertness is going to give them some tunnel vision where they focus in on the threat. That's really common. Everybody reports that after a threat. I certainly know exactly what that is. Uh, your senses become more alert. You do hear better. You do see more intently. You are really alert for noises and sounds that tell you how bad the threat is, what the threat's going to be, and how you're going to meet it. And you're in your mind trying to decide what it is you're going to do. What do you need to do next? How do you have to respond? Are there other threats around you? And, you know, you close in on the ones that you can see. You have tense mus muscles. A lot of men have clenching fists. That's a natural response they don't know about. That's how your body reacts. Tense jaw and other body alterations to prepare for fight. If you ever watch animals on those wild animal shows when they're getting ready to fight, look at their bodies, how they tense up and they kind of lean backwards and they get ready to fight. Same with us. We're humans. We got to defend ourselves. It's a natural thing. The greater the threat, the more you have to adjust. And so... Uh, you tend to focus just on what the threat is. So naturally afterwards, you sometimes expect that they won't remember every detail of the event because they're going through the process of saving their own lives. When I first started working with the impact of trauma on the bodies, what I always taught back in the day, I used to teach officers how to talk to sexual assault victims and uh, assault victims and DV victims. And I reminded them that these victims have just been in a horrible thing that maybe would have cost them their lives. They had to fight for their safety in their life. They're not going to remember every detail of what happened, what happened first, what happened next, when they were fighting, who, who hit whom when. You can't do that after a trauma because your brain's still full of adrenaline and cortisol, and all that's bouncing around. So it's normal for them to have memory loss a little bit. That comes back. You get some of that back. But who's sitting there while they're fighting for their life thinking, okay, I got to remember that I hit him this place and then he hit me there and then we rolled around on the ground and then this happened and that happened. You're just going to remember the big things you responded to. So that's normal for that to happen. And we expect that when we interview anybody about a trauma, they're not going to remember all the details right away. The other part of that is that they're so focused on things, sometimes they don't recognize the danger around them. So there could be other suspects, but they're so focused biologically and mentally on the threat that they sometimes don't see other dangers. So that's scary. So the adrenaline is in there and it's not going to leave for a while. Most people don't sleep the first couple of nights because your brain is so wound up and then you're anxious thinking about what happened. You're anxious, worried about what's next. 
You got to go through a process after a shooting or a major event where you're interviewed. They might take your clothing and your gun. Um, there are all sorts of things that can happen. And, and really all you want to do is go home and kind of relax. And there's procedures and everybody knows that has to happen to secure all the evidence. But it's really hard on the person. That's, but, you know, that's just the way it has to be done. But the brain has been altered because of these chemicals. So what happens is now that you've been in your first critical incident, whether it's a fight for life or uh, something really serious where you had to escape or you had to be in a shooting, you're now much more aware of danger. And so while that memory will eventually go into the back of your brain, it doesn't forget it. So you're now more hypervigilant. One of the things that cops are is hypervigilant about their safety. So we always like to sit in the back of the room where we can see everybody so we can scout out who's dangerous. When they go out to dinner with their families, they like to sit where they can see the door and the escape routes if things get dangerous. Not that that happens very often, but it's just something you learn to do to be safe. So hypervigilance starts and it's a safety thing. The problem is as you get more and more traumas, this kind of increases and it can impact how you live your life. So we'll talk about that a little later. Muscles and body aches are often uh, due to tension from the incident, and those might not go away for a few days. Again, I talked about the memory. Things might be out of order. I tell people, don't fill in the memory. Wait till it comes back on its own if it's going to. Sleep is uh, very difficult, of course, because you've got adrenaline. You probably have racing thoughts about what happened, and oh, you replayed in your mind over and over. You feel isolated because sometimes people don't understand what's happening. Now, that's changing a lot of departments. A lot of departments assign up peer support, and sometimes a family can come in. They get to call their family. So things are much better now, particularly larger departments who do this on a regular basis or they have protocols in place. So people are, are less likely to be isolated and, and left there in rooms. But when I first started, they took everything you were wearing, all of your gear, and you sat in a room basically in your underwear so somebody brought you close. And then you got interviewed a few, a few hours later. And so, you know, who wants to go through all of that? That's changed gratefully, but that's, uh, that's the kind of thing you have to go through. Okay, all of those symptoms are kind of normal. They do go away, and usually within two weeks to a month. They dissipate after a few days, and they keep going away. Oh, we have a question. Why do they take your clothes? Um, there might be evidence on them like blood splatter or um, tears, that sort of thing. Good question. Okay, so like I said, most of these symptoms will go away after, um, with, usually within a month at the latest, but they start to dissipate within a couple of days, usually gone within two weeks. Most people are all excited to go back to work within a couple of weeks. Okay, so 30 days is usually our deadline. If the symptoms are really still strong, uh, that's a concerning thing. And you see that more in people who've been in multiple critical incidents that are really severe. So, um, but if it all settles down, you get sleep returns. If they were sleeping appropriately, um, they can maintain focus better. They have better concentration. Less of a recurring thought about the trauma. They don't think about it every day. It's uh, less of a, a factor. And after that, they are more alert for safety issues because they've been through it. So their brain and body are already ready to uh, take care of them. So they're a little bit more safety conscious. But other than that, things are uh, better and they're usually back to work. Okay, so, um, so go ahead. Trauma cycle for those that have it ongoing. Is it a question or a, or a comment? We're going to talk about more serious trauma, if that's what you're talking about, and, and uh, trauma on top of trauma. We're going to talk about that. Okay, so here's maybe where the childhood stuff comes in. Everybody has different life experiences, and it's not uncommon for officers to have child abuse backgrounds. A lot of officers go into law enforcement because of child abuse backgrounds, and they don't want that to happen to other kids. So. Um, many, many officers are very partial to taking care of kids and getting them out of bad situations. That's a theme amongst many officers because they've been through it. So many times they've resolved that, but trauma is like anything else, it builds up. Okay, so trauma on top of trauma, and if it's untreated, you would probably show up in your um, entry-level psych um, evaluation if you had serious problems because of your childhood trauma. 
and might not be hired because of that. But treatment or time or some kids are resilient, less likely to be a problem. So, you know, um, just anybody can get PTSD, but having past trauma might make that a little bit different experience for you. So we hope that the trauma from this incident is gone within 30 days. Usually, like I said, it's earlier than that. But the thing about trauma is it never really goes away completely. It can pop back up in your brain in six months and sometimes again in two years. Usually it's a temporary thing and you can dispel it with some relaxation or talking about it, doing some journaling, those kinds of things can help. But what we look at is those people who it pops back up for and can't get rid of it. Then we know there's an issue and that might need some help. Okay, I don't know if any of you saw the movie The Joker, but it was a wonderful example. It's a quite a powerful movie, but it's a wonderful example of childhood abuse and trauma and then going through a world where uh, that's dismissed and disminished, disminished, dis <laughs> let's just say dismissed and not taken seriously and uh, um, can't get proper medication, can't get proper treatment. And so the man in this movie develops some psychosis and some aggressive behaviors and ends up in and out of mental hospitals. It's uh, a one, it's really well done. When I watched it, I went, whoa, I'm a big Joker fan, but I went, this is all about what happens to people who are abused as children and never get help and, and remain in bad environments. So I put this in here because a lot of people show a happy face and make it through life, but they have a lot of pain. And that's a lot of first responders that I've worked with. They try to keep working and sometimes the pain is just overwhelming. Okay, so to have PTSD, you have to have certain things to qualify for the diagnosis. And I want to reiterate, that doesn't mean you wouldn't, if you don't qualify for the diagnosis, doesn't mean you wouldn't have a trauma problem. It doesn't mean you wouldn't have anxiety. It doesn't mean you wouldn't have depression. All those things can still happen. But the big name, you have to have these things. So you have to have been exposed to death, threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury, or actual or threatened sexual violence. So direct exposure be part of that. Witnessing in person, indirectly by learning that a close relative or friend was exposed to trauma. And it has to be pretty close relative for that to be an indirect one. And it has to be a death or near death, and it needs to be violent or accidental. So a really serious car accident to a husband. You are not expecting that. That's an example of that. A heart attack to somebody who was not sick. And so those are examples of that. A crime victim, your, your spouse was killed in a crime. That's traumatic. So those kinds of things would qualify. A few years ago, they added one that I was so grateful for because this was what I lived through. Repre repeated and direct exposure to aversive details of an event. And we're talking about, um, they added the part about people who have to work sex crimes and particularly those who have to look at uh, depictions of child sexual abuse, the people who have to deal with the child porn. That stuff is repulsive and it's visual and you're watching pictures of children have horrible things happen to them. And it causes depression immediately almost and um, psychological trauma. Of course it's horrible and people of kids really suffer from this as well. Also collecting body parts at crime scenes. Uh, my first job in detectives three days in, I had to dig up a dead body who had been killed by her husband. So not a fun thing. I had no training and I had to dig it up by hand because we didn't know how well she'd been uh, disintegrated. We had a small department. People were out chasing the bad guy. So I got the, that detail. I can remember it to this day. And of course, um, any kind of uh, veterans who've had to clean up body parts in war. Oh, I've seen so many veterans who had to clean up their buddies after they got blown up in an IED explosion. How awful that must be for them. So, yeah, that's one of those things that would qualify. This does not include watching violent media and video games and all of that stuff. That's on you. So that doesn't count. Okay. So you have to have all these symptoms to go with it. So if it meets that criteria, any of those, you have to have recurring dreams or disturbing memories. So the nightmares or intrusive memories. Intrusive memories mean not now and then. They mean like you can't get rid of them. Like they're a video in your head. You keep, And every time something happens that reminds you of it, like a car color, a smell, you see it. You feel it. You feel like you're back there. Persistent avoidance of the stimuli associated with the trauma. 
So what we see with first responders is if they've had a shooting or a fight for life somewhere, they don't want to go by that area, so they'll avoid it. And so they're avoiding that area when that's the quickest way to get to a call. Or they'll avoid those kinds of calls. So they don't want that kind of reminder because it triggers bad memories. It makes them feel bad. So we have ways we can reduce that for them so they can get back to work and, and go back to those areas where they need to serve. A lot of negativity. Remember at the beginning when I talked about the old grumpy cops on the shift who didn't like anything and didn't like anything new and hated, didn't want to work? There you go. Negative thoughts about people. They've been hurt by people, so they don't have a good opinion of people. They've been hurt by situations and um, not had any help, so they are angry. And they don't know how to experience positive emotions. And so when they go home, they're grumpy with their family. The kids walk on eggshells. And it's a terrible situation. And then people, um, you get overreactive to perceived threats of danger. And I see this in all populations. It's the anger response when you think you're threatened. People with PTSD have road rage off the charts. They are easily angered by any kind of verbal threat or aggression that maybe isn't even aggression. They just have to see it that way. They have mood swings that are really quick. They can't concentrate. Sleep issues are huge because nightmares. Who wants to go to sleep? Or they keep thinking and remembering the trauma. Any questions? Not so far. Any scores? <laughs> <laughs> So some things that happen, uh, you might be detached from others, including family. Now, might is a, a word that I probably shouldn't use because this is what happens. This is when they often end up coming in to see help because their spouse has said, that's it. You don't participate in the family. You're grumpy all the time. Go get some help. And that's usually the first thing that I hear when they come in. 14-3 with two minutes to half. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Environment seems unreal, distant, or dreamlike. Okay, so this one, if I see this in an officer, I really have to put them on leave because this is dangerous. This is dissociation. That means you're checking out and actually feel you're back at the scene. If any of you saw the movie American Sniper, there's a scene where he comes back from war and he's sitting at in the living room and there's a party in the house behind him gathering of some sort. His wife comes in and says, all you see is him and says, hey, you're going to come out and join the party. And he says, yeah, I'm just finishing watching the show. And they pan over and the TV's not even on. What happens is he's back in, I think he was in Afghanistan, but it could have been Iraq, one of those two. And he was back in a mission where he was having to do a, 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 be a sniper and kill someone. That is what happens with PTSD in the extreme end. I've had officers sit on my couch and I have said something that triggered a memory and they have drifted off and they're looking off into the distance. They're shaking, they're sweating. I'm trying to bring them out of it. They don't hear me. They don't see me. I'm snapping my fingers. I'm not going to go over there and, and you know shake them because you know they're going to swing. But they're actually reliving the trauma that they had. It's really disturbing to see, and it's a very serious sign of PTSD at the higher end. Okay, brain pictures. Who doesn't love that? So it used to be when people had PTSD or trauma, people would say, just, just get over it. And that always irritated me because I knew at some level it had to be neurobiological. It's not all in their head. Well, it is in some ways because remember I talked about cortisol and adrenaline. So if you look at the healthy brain, there's a little bit of red in the back and on the lower end that's red. That's where everything goes after it pumps into your brain to help you meet a threat or you're excited or you do sports. All that stuff goes away. That becomes a memory. If you look at the other brain, the PTSD brain, that's cortisol and adrenaline that never went away. If you keep doing that to your brain <clears throat> over and over and over, that stuff can't dissipate. So the memories stay in your head. The anxiety, which is what that is, stays in your head and you can't manage it on your own. So, you know, when people tell me, just get over it, that's what they want to say to people. I, I bite my tongue, but I do tell them you can't say that because it's not true. That's like telling somebody who broke their knee, just get up and walk, get over it. Think about it that way. It's actually a medical condition. Okay, other things that make it worse for police are long investigations because they are long if they're shootings or somebody dies or you know there's some sort of internal complaint. 
And that you, nobody likes waiting to find the outcome. That's just a normal human reaction. That doesn't help. Media nowadays, uh, you know, really everything's published. People make their own opinions. They comment on what should have been done when they have no police experience. They don't wait for the facts. That makes ang officers angry and they're anxious and they're depressed. And anybody who comes in my office, I make them shut down their Facebook, get off Instagram, and don't read the comments in uh, any of the online papers because it's all negative and it makes your anger worse. And once they do that, then they don't have to deal with that part of it. So that helps a little bit. And I'd say that with you too. If there's something you don't like, stop looking at it and it will help you calm down. And lots of disparaging things get said um, about officers on social media. So that's really tough. <clears throat> and I know you had some training on uh, use of force. So hopefully that was enlightening to you because it's way different than it looks in the movies. Okay, we managed to save almost everything in your van from the fire except the bread, it's toast. <laughs> So, you know, I got to do firefighter jokes just because cops and firefighters have a natural rivalry, so. Okay, but we can help. And I have lots of cops who went back to work or never left work because we were able to treat them early on and get that fixed. Cognitive restructuring is where we learn to see the trauma differently. Your experience is what you remember it, but we can help you to see it differently. Doesn't mean the facts change, it just means how you feel about it changes. Distress tolerance, which are techniques for relaxation, calming, emotional regulation, PTSD comes with those mood swings. We wanna help people regulate that. Exposure therapy is a way of actually really facing the trauma head on in a couple of different ways and confronting the emotions that go with it. It's not necessarily the event, it's the emotional attachment to that event. So we work on that. Again, emotion focused therapy is about dealing with the emotional content. E EMDR is about re reducing the trauma through um, some, it's a very interesting process. Some of you may have had it for depression or anxiety. It does seem to control some things in some people. Some people can't tolerate it, but it, it has to do with rapid eye movement. And medication, severe PTSD will not get better until we can settle down all that stuff you saw in the brain so I work with the medical providers to use medications that will not impact work if they want to stay working. That doesn't cause any kind of um, symptoms that would be a problem for a first responder. They're usually at the level of maybe a vitamin almost. They're so low, but they can take the edge off and help people recover. Okay, other things that add to this. Now remember, it's not just the stuff that happens to them, but shift work is brutal. You have rotating shifts. It takes 28 days to adjust to a shift change. Well, some departments change every couple of weeks or they make you work two weeks one shift, two weeks another shift. That's just really awful. Oh, 24 hour shifts for fire departments. Those guys are so tired when they come in. They look like zombies because they work the 24 hours. If it's a busy place, they don't sleep. They go home, they try to have a life. They go back to work another 24 hours. By the time they've done 10 years and they're 30, they look 50. Unless they get promoted and they get to sit at a desk. So, um, let's see. Overtime, always mandatory. Find a department that doesn't have mandatory overtime. They're always so short shifted. Workload, call load, low staffing, those all contribute limited breaks. I remember swing shifts where they were so busy for weeks on end because we were a busy area. And although it's a bad thing to do, sometimes you go through the McDonald's, you get a burger, you get a call, you throw the burger in the bag. By the time you get it, it's congealed. It's like, do I want to eat that or do I want to not just not eat today? Poor diet choices, irregular eating schedule, impact on your family and free time. People, they want to be with their families too. There's holidays coming up. Lots of officers will not get to participate in Thanksgiving and Christmas and Mother's and Father's Day and all those things that everybody else enjoys. They know that when they sign up, but that still doesn't make it easy. Back injury is common because you sit in cars that, um, particularly departments where they share cars, so you know the person adjusts the seat differently than you use it. If you carry a gun belt on your hip, it wedges into the back of the, the car. I noticed that after a few years, it's like, oh, I'm sitting crooked, that's not good. Injuries, of course, exposure to diseases, citizen complaints and internal affairs, and then 
the more you uh, stay in a, a department of any type, the more you get reluctant to pay attention to new rules and procedures because it means you have to change things. And like everybody else, cops don't like change. It's just normal. But you do it because sometimes they're good changes. Okay, so here's when I teach, when I teach this to lots of law enforcement at all the levels, state, local, federal. Here's when change is needed. Is there family and relationship stress, like few arguments and distancing, that isn't related to one of them, like doing something bad to cause it? It's off, when it happens, it's because there's isolating and detachment, not wanting to participate when really nothing else has changed. Increase in use of alcohol. This is the killer for cops. We self-medicate with alcohol. Alcoholism in cops always off the charts. A lot of times the guys come in with the severe PTSD, I got to send them to rehab first before I can even treat them. Prescription pills because they go get anxiety medications and some of those are really addictive. And so they're trying to, to help themselves feel better by taking those so they can go to work. So I got to get them off those. Firefighters, because marijuana became legal, a lot of them are self-medicating with, with marijuana. I have to send them to treatment because it is addictive for some people. And then, of course, every now and then you see some people who do the illegal drugs. I don't see much of that with this population, but I certainly see the first three. Affairs are really common with first responders because their brain is so full of adrenaline. They're looking for ways to feel excited again. And so having affairs is exciting. Not a good idea. or can damage a lot of stuff, but it's exciting. So you see that. With the use of computers, we see the porn use go up dramatically. And porn, well, not addictive, it can be compulsive. And so that is not good for relationships if you're looking at porn instead of being with your spouse. And this is not just a casual use. This is like long-term, hour at a time, locking yourself in a room stuff. I'm seeing more and more of this, as are all the treatment providers. So sex becomes a means of distraction from the pain, a way of feeling better. I just talked about avoidance of friends, family, and isolating. Lack of interest in hobbies they used to like to do. I get complaints about my husband doesn't want to go camping anymore. We used to do that all the time. He won't go to a movie with me. Weight gain and compulsive eating. That's up. I want any donut jokes here, but yeah, that happens. Consistent negative viewpoint that did not exist previously. Well, that kind of comes with the job. No matter what you do, you see such bad stuff, you're going to get a little negative. But when it's to the point where you're those grumpy old guys, that's a problem. Of course, anger, depression, anxiety, those are things that need to be treated. And one of the key factors for cops is increased citizen complaints. You're going to get a few here and there, but when they start to come in about the cop was really rude, he was angry, I started a fight, we didn't have to have one. When your partners come up to you and say, hey, you know, this was going fine and you pissed the guy off, what are you doing? Those are signs that there's a problem. Okay, so I already talked about a lot of these that happen for first responders, not necessarily all that different from people who have high pressure jobs doing other things too, back pain and different kinds of injuries, but there's a lot of physical stuff in both of the jobs, the so firefighting and police, hypertension is really common, heart problems, lots of stomach and distress stuff. Alcoholism again, I've talked about that, uh, the porn stuff damage from uh, chemicals. Uh, one of my good friends, the, we had meth labs. We were just getting, we got them in uh, when I was working the road and nobody knew how to handle them and didn't realize how poisonous they were. And my poor friend who was an officer passed out at one. And so we learned that we had to like wear protection, but a lot of people got exposed to, to the meth labs and other burning chemicals long before we knew how to take care of ourselves. Okay, suicide. Wished I didn't have to talk about this, but like I said, it's going up all sorts of places. Actual suicide rate for employed officers has been similar to the general population, but they don't count the retired or disabled officers, the officers that had to go because they were injured on the job or the officers who retired. That's We know that's high because we hear about it and the national organizations are starting to track that. I work a, fed, um, a national hotline and one day a week, and I get a lot of calls from suicidal cops. 
who are on duty or retired. It's um, really an epidemic here. Retirement and forced termination to anybody is distressing, but for police work and firefighting, that's your identity. That's a real big deal, particularly for males. So it can be a real difficult time because once you leave police work and firefighting, you've left the family. You've left that group that takes care of you. You've left your safety net. And now you have to figure out how to do something else. You feel abandoned and alone. So um, there are ways to help with that. But, you know, you have to want to get help or know how to get help. And if you've been told your whole career, you don't tell anybody to be strong, who's going to go get help? And of course, alcoholism makes that worse. Um, we have medical issues that might be on top of that, loss of relationships. Again, it was standard in the industry when I started that cops were divorced multiple times. So I always put in when I teach cops, here's what healthy looks like. Go ahead. Uh, so referencing again, the um, trauma cycle, these are areas what I meant by being stuck in the trauma cycle. Mm -hmm. So here's healthy lives, and I always uh, I teach this both when I give presentations and when I work with officers, once I get them stabilized, if they're really severely distressed, and we talk about how we need to fill in the blanks for all these different things, establishing, maintaining close relationships. That doesn't have to be romantic. It could be friendships. Cops not having friends outside of firefighting or firefight, uh, police or firefighting, that's bad. You've got to have friends that are normal people out in the real world so you see that the whole world isn't negative so i really push that you have to be able to see reality as it is not just a negative point of view so as you can see by these you want to have a well-rounded person to go through this career and we need to help them do better in seeing that there's more in life than just the job they have to have a full life and ways to deal with things off duty so I just think that's a really healthy chart, and that's how I get people ready to leave treatment, is they should be at a point where we can say, okay, we filled most of these blanks in, whatever they're going to do. They're going to stay in law enforcement or go on to something else. Okay. <clears throat> Number one thing you can do, exercise. That's for anybody. Exercise works off stress and anger, and I put guys right back in the gym because a lot of times the PTSD guys have just isolated in their room, drinking or avoiding everybody. So I just tell them, okay, get back in the gym, get a home gym, take the clothes off the treadmill that you got hanging there and start working out. <laughs> Put a TV in front of it if you need to, just get on the treadmill. Let's talk about a reasonable diet. Doesn't have to be perfect, but you know, let's stop eating at the fast food. Uh, take a lunch, take your lunch to work, or if you're at home, start learning how to cook. I've made a lot of cooks out of guys who are at home on L&I and Workman's Comp. The wives very much appreciate that. When they come home, they have a nice hot meal. So I'm popular with the wives. Activities and friends outside law enforcement. You really have to do this. We talked about this earlier. Have goals for leaving law enforcement. You saw that when I came in, I saw those old guys and I said, I'm going to do something else at 30 years. I remind people, many people have more than one career. So start planning now. What do you want to do? What is interests you that isn't law enforcement when you get out or firefighting? What would you like to do with your life? And not all agencies can provide advancement and transfer opportunities, which really help uh, reduce PTSD. Because if you can get out of patrol for a while, which is where most of that happens, you can uh, kind of take a break. So if you can get into crime prevention or uh, some sort of detective job that isn't child abuse or homicide, or you can do some sort of other, um, maybe in background checks or whatever, for new hires or training, those kinds of things. Those help a lot give a break from the road. And so if a department can do that, that's great. But if they can't, you have to find other ways. So I explore with the officers, what else can you do? Can you coach Little League or can you join some kind of club you like? Can you do more outdoor activities? You need a support system, of course, both inside the job and out. And part of that should be family. It's okay to go to therapy for realignment. I have a number of officers who come in. They meet with me. They get to know me. And they say, okay, I'm going to come in just when I need to. I'm already established. And they call when they have a traumatic incident. And they come in. We work it through really quick. You know, it takes one session. They're out and they're good. So that's a good way for officers to deal with that too. Don't worry, firefighter, I has you. So I like critters. So. 
and I always teach them how I put it back on them to help each other. I think that telling each other that you have to suck it up is not going to work. And that's old days. We need to help each other fix it. And I do see more and more of that in departments where officers are going up to each other and say, hey, you know, you don't look so good. And we have hotlines now. Code 4 is, is local. They're great. They have lots of referrals. It's confidential. National cop line, like I said, they have referrals in every state and multiple cities. So if people feel a little weird about calling locally, they can call nationally. So there's two great resources. We have some inpatient treatment that specialize in cops and firefighters, and a lot of them go back to work. So there's ways to help. And these are the uh, little guys I babysit once in a while. That's my office. And if you can get French Bulldogs to sit still for a picture like that, you're pretty talented. Thank you. Any questions? Looks like there is one. How has COVID affected first responders with being able to de-stress? It's actually um, increased the problem because, you know, they worry about getting diseases too. So I actually saw an increase when COVID hit and started to kick in because they were confused about, well, what do we do? Do we go to calls? Then they were a little frustrated because they couldn't book people in the jail and that's what police do, you know. Uh, so firefighters, I think, took a bigger hit on this because they had to do massive suits. Um, they put more clothes on to go in. And so they're wearing all this extra hot gear to go treat people for the medical calls. And a lot of them got exposed. Huge amounts of them got exposed to it and to the point where they had trouble staffing offices all over the place. So it's a little bit more panic with them. Do you use... Do you use mindfulness or yoga in your treatment? Have you read The Body Keeps the Score? Have read The Body Keeps the Score. I refer for yoga. I can't bend, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of mindfulness. In fact, I don't tell them it's mindfulness because they're cops, but we do it. We do a lot of it because it's really helpful, and I do a lot of things they can do on their own. I teach, That's actually the first two sessions. We do nothing but try to find things that work for them that are easy to relax. Uh, in the military, we are training soldiers how to support another soldier who is suicidal. Talk to them, don't leave, escort to professional treatment. Is there training for first responders to take care of each other? A lot of departments have the peer support, which they're trained. So they go to training. There's also some uh, CISM, and I think that's what they call it. And different agencies uh, have eight officers who are involved in that who do training. Uh, who have training to work with officers, we're really promoting, and a lot of the bigger departments are really good at promoting, uh, taking care of each other and working with that. But I couldn't tell you who does what. I don't work well, in the department. Just going back to your one of your slides, and I don't remember what you called it, but you were saying how you kind of lobbied for that vicarious, like repeated sort of traumatic exposure, not smaller incidents, but it seems to me that as departments adopt more of that into their leadership, when they identify those things that they would proactively do that rather than because you know like you said you know cops aren't going to go oh yep it's That's been nice. too many um this yep. week i need a i need help um and then someone's asking what you do for your own self-care you know i usually get that one so obviously i like football so we're good in the winter <laughs> mm -hmm. um one of the things i discovered when i was uh, working in the, the towards the end of sex crimes i needed an outlet and I really like heavy metal music. So I started going to heavy metal concerts and standing in mosh pits. And I went, I watched all the mayhem, listened to the music. And for some reason, it calmed me down. And it took me, I, I had to pay attention so I wouldn't get hit. So it took me out of law enforcement and let me have some fun. So I still do that. And that's how I take care of myself. That is so cool. How, talk about unexpected. Like yeah. I never <laughs> you would say you're going to the heavy metal mosh pit. Yeah. Metallica right? tattoo. That's <laughs> So score 21 to 3 at the half. <gasps> yes. All right. So, Thank you, whoever's doing that. I love you. Uh, so um, I had a question. I, I wondered, because um, you have so much exposure or so much experience um, on both sides. So you've, you've had this massive career as a law enforcement person. Now you've got all the education on the psychology of it and sort of this after effect. And if you, as you've seen sort of... Um, this explosion in the media of, and that, you know, kind of that's what prompted these classes with some kind of discussion to dig a little deeper into training and hiring and all of those things. 
what would you want to tell the public if you if you if you could have one thing to say to the public at large that has really no family members that are in law enforcement or what would you tell them to sort of maybe talk engage them or give them another story or just what would you say in regards to what's going on right yeah, now just just as with all the the, the the things you're seeing on the other side, right? You've you've done the job, so you know what's involved. Now you're treating the guys that did the job. Mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing all those impacts. You're seeing what's happening in the you know world in terms of policing. What would you say to the public about cops? Policing has changed a lot over the years, and I think that overall a pretty good job, at least in the Northwest, of taking care of folks and keeping up on the training. And I know our department after the Rodney King incident, which obviously we weren't involved in was LA, but we experienced a lot of fallout, like a lot of departments, started citizen boards where uh, different groups could come in and express concerns to the department and be part of the process of you know, getting feedback. And we sent, we had citizen academies for like this one, mm -hmm. but we also had them for, we had a huge Asian influx from the refugee camps. So we set up academies for them so they can learn the laws and meet officers and not be afraid of them because some of their cultures, they were afraid. And I learned Vietnamese so I could speak to them because I thought that would be fun. And so, you know, there were things that we did. I know that CLPD did a lot of different kinds of outreach groups for homeless and for people who were mentally ill. And that is a big topic that's always been on a lot of, there was a program that I don't know if it's still around, but it went through for several years, um, the training to teach officers how to deal with people who are mentally ill or intellectually disabled and needed help. Uh, it started with a C also, but I can't remember what it was. But that one was also a good one. So, I, you know, there's lots of departments that are do things, but I think sometimes citizens need to say, hey, we'd like to be part of that or we'd like to know more about what you do. So find out what your department does. And a lot of that's on websites. And I think citizen involvement is good. I do wish, which I, same thing I wished back in the day, is that people would wait to reserve judgment a little bit till they got all the facts. That would be nice. Because I look at some of these and I go, ooh, that's bad. And then I look at other ones and I go, well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's totally what the person should have done. But I lived it. So, you know, but there's some I've looked at and went, oh, that's horrible. God, what was he thinking? You know? Yeah, maybe to, to the due process piece. You know, mm -hmm. allow, allow the system to work and... Uh, I think that's and I have no problem with expressing your concerns. Obviously, that's as a citizen, you need to. You need to if there's something going on, you need to talk to your officials about that. Yeah. So Jim wanted to say um, about your heavy metal attendance that that's great. Whatever works, that's healthy. <laughs> and then Wendy, who's been keeping score for you, says keep pushing to implement that debrief after incidents. Yes, that is a big project for me, and um, I I like that. Many departments have asked me in for wellness lectures just like this, which you never saw years ago. And now my schedule is often, I usually have one or two a month that I do for different departments. And, you know, so that's really nice that they're seeing that. And that includes little departments that normally wouldn't do something like that. And so I, that's my public service. I like doing that so that, you know, let's keep our officers healthy. No, I, I agree. You're doing such great work. I got Thank a you. I got a question for oh, you. Oh, good, Chief. Yeah. I was just starting to think about, you know, certainly when you started, like you said, that women were not in law enforcement mm -hmm. back then very much. And even when I started, it wasn't even still. I started in 94, mm -hmm. was still pretty rare. Uh, but now we're getting a lot more. Uh, mm -hmm. what, would you say that, that are you finding that women respond to trauma differently or is it pretty much it doesn't there that doesn't have an impact on it? Uh, I was just curious to see if. That's a, nice. actually a great question because I do know about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they have found that women officers do a lot better managing trauma with, uh, because there's something different between men and women. And one of the things that women do is we're verbal. We're social animals more than men are as far as talking about feelings and that sort of thing. And women tend to have groups. So I know my area, there was a group of women that met and scrapbooked. It's the old like quilting bee kind of thing. Yeah. And they would talk about stuff. And so women tend to have a lot less of it in law enforcement, not that they don't. And if women do have trauma, often it's because of uh, sexual harassment or that kind of internal stuff that has impacted their career. 
That's great. Yeah. So I'm going to tell my husband all that talking. Um, <laughs> he should you listen. You have to listen because yeah. actually I did attend some training um, from the um, preparedness, emergency preparedness academy that they do. And uh, there was a speaker who was a former advocate in a county up north. And she said that the talking is the therapy, like that you keep talking. And she said, you know, a lot of people get irritated, family members, because they keep talking. But she said that actually the talking is where the therapy is occurring. And pretty soon they won't need to talk about it anymore. Yep. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that is that makes perfect sense. I recommend people just say, just listen. She's not looking for an answer. She's not looking for you to solve it. She's looking for you just to let her talk about it. Yeah. And that works really well for women. Yeah. No, I think it's great. So we need to just tell our, our law enforcement that they need to use their words. Yes. <laughs> use your words. Just what I like to tell them. <laughs> use your words. Okay. We got a few more here. We're giant toddlers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With the tragedy of the two deputies being killed in the line of duty over the last three years, how do you help fellow deputies on such a large scale? Well, I <clears throat> do work with deputies who've experienced that kind of loss. And so it's there's grief, but there's also guilt for not having solved it or been there, even though they couldn't have been there. That's really common in both military and first responders and parents who lose somebody. And so you have to work with both the grief and the guilt. And that's a longer process for them to forgive themselves for that and how to work through that. A little more difficult, so you can work with it. And I have uh, worked through many officer deaths all over the state. So, are there different considerations for CSI type and forensic investigators in terms of their response to trauma? Uh, they see pretty horrible things too, and I have treated them as well. So. What about dispatchers? I've treated a couple. Um, they also have the, the problem they have is they don't see it and they don't experience, but they're left hanging. Yeah. And so there's a lot of anxiety about one doing their job right, but also they never get the final answer. They never see what happened. They have to guess. And so they're kind of overlooked sometimes. Yeah, I can see that. OK, group, is there any other questions? We're going to kind of wrap Great up. questions. You know, they're all married. Any, and any spouses out there? Of officers or firefighters? I think we do have a few okay. out there. Yeah. Me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of our um, public safety commissioners. Her husband is a firefighter. Okay. Yep. And let's see a daughter. So he has a daughter. Figured there might be some. Yeah. So now you know the warning signs and when they need help, right? Uh, husband is a peer support coordinator. Okay. Um, which is uh, Amy's husband is also a firefighter and peer support coordinator. Yeah. So now you kind of know what to look for and how to gently nudge them to help. And there's lots of providers. I have a whole list of them. Um, so I can send them to anybody you need. And they're all over the area. So there's no need to go without help. The only place we don't have many is Eastern Washington. So consequently, I have a pile of clients from there. Wow. So. Fortunately, uh, Ellen and I is letting us do that virtually for a little bit while we have COVID. So, um, uh, Wendy's saying this could be a longer class. <laughs> so, um, lots of good information, and I'm sure there's, you know, you could dive down several rabbit holes that you yep. have on here. There are lots of rabbit holes. Yes, and lots of people saying thank you for this important work, fascinating and thank you presentation. Thank you so. Thanks much. Thanks for attending. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad we have this kind of program. It's been so great, and Dr. Thompson, this is the first time we've had someone like you. We've done the our community academies throughout, you know, in UP for probably three or four years now. We've done them twice a year, but we've never brought anybody in on with your kind of subject matter expertise um, and so I hope that you know as we continue to do this you'll you'll be a partner to this because it has been a wonderful that's my mission <laughs> that's wonderful and it's been it's so good for for people to understand these things and especially with just the COVID even just our medical workers I was thinking about nurses and you know our doctors mm -hmm. during this COVID time how they're just I thought a lot about them as I watched the pictures of them and exhausted and I said I'm hoping that there's help for them. And then I read somewhere where some of the hospitals were bringing in therapists to help them recover from some of that. So I said, okay, good. Yeah. Someone's asking, 
Crystal's asking, do you only treat officers and first responders? I used to treat um, military vet war veterans, and I would occasionally take uh, citizens, but I got so full, I had to save it for officers because, you know, they got to get back in the field or, you know, they're suicidal. So I had to take quit taking citizens. Now, if that ever goes away, then I'll go back to take a few of those. Thank you. Lots of good information. Does UP have peer support group and do you use the chaplains for officer support? Yes. Um, the Sheriff's Department does have a peer support yes. team with, oh, I would say somewhere in the area of eight deputies assigned that are trained. And there's a the leader of that group actually is your former chief, Mike Blair. Uh, he supervises that unit. Um, and we do have a chaplain at the department. Um, that is also available to support officers and deputies uh, throughout the Sheriff's Department and UP. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Thompson, and I know uh, Chief's going to want to close it out, so I'm going to mute my mute my and I'll turn. Thanks, everybody. Let me just mute it so we don't have an echo. All right, it's on me. Right. Thanks, Dr. Thompson. Appreciate all your work in that. And um, I, I feel like I need to maybe apologize a little bit to everybody that I didn't give a little bit of a disclaimer at the beginning of, you know, I know for use of force, we kind of said, hey, some of this stuff could be a little traumatic to you because um, I know I feel a little heavy at the end of this conversation. Um, and some of that is obviously uh, living in this world for for many years now and, and as a parent now of a law enforcement officer. Um, I, I have to look at it from a, a different lens now too. So um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you so much for being here um, and being with us for, for this program. Um, I think we're going to shoot out uh, an email to all of you with a little survey to try and get some feedback on the on the whole academy and some suggestions that you might have about topics and, and different things for the next one um, and some other things that we have. So look out for that email here in the next few days. Um, and I think that was about it. Jennifer, am I remember forgetting no, anything? You remember anything? Any, any questions or information that they need at any point, please reach out to us and to, we'll be running the academy, we hope, again in the spring. Yeah, probably late spring. We'll be doing this again. So yeah, if any questions pop up, don't hesitate to shoot us an email and we'll we'll try to get to, get to those. And I think that's about it. Thanks for being here, everybody. Still have